Tonight we celebrate National Women's Health Week with a look at the role that the media plays in women's health decisions and public perceptions of women's health issues. We're very pleased to have with us Judy Norsegian, Executive Director of Our Bodies Ourselves, one of the nation's leading women's health organizations. Please help me welcome Judy Norsegian. <laughs> Thank you so much, Monica. I bring greetings from all of us at Our Bodies Ourselves. We're located in the South End, and if you're ever in that area and want to drop by, you're welcome to. As many of you know, the Our Bodies Ourselves first appeared in 1970, and this eighth edition is coming out in its 35th anniversary year. We're quite enthusiastic about the new book, the new look, the new pictures, all the updated material. And we're also excited about the many translation adaptations of the book that have been recently completed or are underway in different parts of the world as we speak. Because I tend to speak very quickly, and I'm very sensitive to what I'm doing to my friend next to me, I'm going to try to read rather than speak because it can slow me down. And uh, during the question and answer period, feel free to raise other issues. I am simply going to pick out a few critical women's health concerns, but by all means, if you want to talk about something else, feel free to. Um, as we watch television, read the newspapers, and listen to the radio, we may not be aware that half of everything reported in the news today originates from a PR firm, a public relations firm and that some of the products and activities that parade before us on the screen are actually product placements paid for by a company rather than the idea of the original script writer. The media's primary source of income is now the more than $100 billion per year spent on advertising. There are also many more so-called grassroots organizations or astroturf groups, as John Stauber has dubbed them. He's the author of something called Toxic Sludge is Good for You. The, these organizations look and sound like public citizen interest groups. They even have grassroots sounding names that use the rhetoric of social change and activism, much like you would see in our books or in materials published by the National Women's Health Network um, a sister organization. They are, however, groups created for corporate clients with a particular marketing agenda that usually does not have a public interest mission at its roots. Women are primary targets of pharmaceutical advertising and need to be especially aware of mass media messages characterized by misleading hype rather than well-documented facts. It is one reason why I believe that media literacy is such an important skill to develop even from a very young age. And I did bring with me some sample issues of Teen Voices. It's a national magazine based here in Boston, partly because I think it does a good job of trying to create better media literacy among young girls and teenagers. Today I'd like to point out a few examples of advertising and reporting that have misled the public you will probably have your own examples to share during our discussion period. Some of these examples underscore how important it is to find out, when possible, the source of the information we get. We may not always be able to discern the quality and accuracy of what we read or what we see, but when potential conflicts of interest exist, when the sponsor of a message stands to gain by our using a particular product or service, that is always a reason to be cautious. Now I'm going to talk first about the example of breast implants. One example of a publicity campaign that misled the public concerned breast implants. Around 1992, the breast implant industry and the American Society of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgeons, otherwise known as ASPERS at that time, spent $4 million on a PR campaign that tried to downplay the potential risks of silicone breast implants and to block regulatory action by the FDA that might restrict access to silicone breast implants. 
A well-funded publicity effort underscored the greed of trial lawyers involved in breast implant litigation, referred to all the medical literature indicating problems with silicone implants as junk science, and urged women to phone and write the FDA to protest any regulation of the use of silicone implants. Rhetoric about giving women a choice was heavily employed, and paid advertising spots featured women who wanted their right to choose breast implants. In all the media flurry, what was often overlooked was the fact that breast implant safety had never been demonstrated in more than 30 years of use, despite the repeated pleas of women's health advocates and scientists at the Food and Drug Administration. Because of the insistence of groups like the Command Trust Network, the National Women's Health Network, and Our Bodies Ourselves, as well as the principled stance taken by the then FDA commissioner, Dr. David Kessler, silicone implants were restricted to clinical trial use and mechanisms to collect more meaningful safety data were put in place. Appropriately, women who want to undergo breast reconstruction after surgery for breast cancer were allowed and still are allowed access to silicone gel implants, and they were to be monitored afterwards for potential problems. Interestingly, when saline breast implants came under closer scrutiny in August of 2000, at hearings conducted by the FDA, there was hardly any media coverage. At these hearings, it was noted that more than 190,000 problems from all breast implants had been officially reported to the FDA, including 123 deaths. These complaints represent potentially more than 10% of the estimated 1.5 million women who then had breast implants. Much of this information is available in an FDA consumer booklet published at the FDA website, complete with photographs of adverse implant outcomes such as disfigurement, capsular contracture, that's when the breast becomes hard and misshapen, and deflation. But relatively few women know about the FDA resource, while many do visit the websites created by plastic surgeons or the implant industry. And you can be sure that a very different picture of risk versus benefits is presented at these websites. Afterwards, when I show some slides, I'll give you some examples of the slides you would see at the FDA website. Although public interest organizations like ours have limited resources for conducting a media campaign alerting women to these problems, we more recently have had some success in reaching the public with op-eds and other media exposure after the recent FDA advisory panel hearings last month, especially because FDA scientists have been doing research that has created more cause for concern, for example, growing, for example, growing evidence of a link between silicone breast implants and fibromyalgia. Hopefully the FDA will insist that adequate long-term safety data will be collected before these devices will be freely available to women and even young girls across the country. I'm going to leave out um, some of the statistics from Inamed's own data, but even th th this is an implant manufacturer, even their own data suggests significant problems. In addition, Inamed did report an alarming increase in many symptoms associated with autoimmune diseases for all implant patients, whether saline or silicone, including joint pain, fatigue, hair loss, and muscle pain. At the very least, we should be studying these much more closely before we let a product go on the market um, primarily for cosmetic use. One of the more difficult aspects of the ongoing debate about the risks of silicone implants has been the problem with medical nomenclature. The constellation of symptoms and problems women have experienced often don't correspond to currently accepted medical diagnoses. But that does not mean that these problems are not real. If one interviews one of the many doctors who have looked more closely at the joint aches, fatigue, dry mouth and eyes, and the masses of silicone that have hardened in up to 70% of these women's chests over time, one understands that there are illnesses caused by implants. We just don't understand them very well yet. In a climate where cosmetic surgery and breast implant procedures are heavily advertised and promoted, it is not surprising that augmentation is on the rise, despite the mounting evidence of harm. Many young girls are now given breast jobs as a high school graduation gift, and for girls under 18, the use of these implants is off-label. Choices are certainly great, but we need safe choices. 
What kind of choice is it to approve a product with very high complication rates and unknown health risks over time? Am I going slow enough for you? A little slower. I'm really trying. Talk about breast cancer for a moment. In a spring 2001 newsletter article from the Women's Cancer Resource Center in Berkeley, California, activist and author Judy Brady wrote the following in her critique of breast cancer coverage. There's no talk about prevention, except in terms of lifestyle, your diet, for instance. No talk about ways to grow food more safely. No talk about how to curb industrial carcinogens. No talk about contaminated water or global warning. She is not alone in her concern. Dr. C.W. Jameson of the U.S. National Institutes of Health has said, quote, I really don't think environmental causes of cancer are acknowledged enough. It warrants attention so people can make better, more informed choices as to where they live or what professions they work in. Dr. Jameson has been the director of a biennial report on cancer-causing agents published by the Institute of Environmental Sciences at NIH. But the media rarely highlight these reports, as the government does not carry out an elaborate PR campaign when this report is released. We all know that measuring carcinogenic agents remains quite difficult, despite recent gains, for example, the development of body burden tests, as leaders at the CDCs, that's the Centers for Disease Controls, National Center for Environmental Health have pointed out, it can take decades to prove correlations between toxins and cancer, since it can be many years between the time of exposure to the time a tumor might develop. But that does not mean we shouldn't try. Ironically, these kinds of messages are few and far between in most mainstream media coverage. An excellent fall 2002 issue of Southern Exposure magazine ran an expose provocatively titled Running from the Truth, How the Susan G. Komen Foundation Fights Healthcare Reforms and Fails Breast Cancer Patients. It's quite a controversial title. It chronicles how Komen founder Nancy G. Brinker opposed a meaningful patient's bill of rights. It's the one that Senator Ted Kennedy championed several years ago. And actively campaigned for the elder Bush. It also pointed out that numerous conflicts of interest were not stated at the Komen Foundation website. For example, seats on boards of private cancer treatment corporations, stock interests, and lobbying ties. Most significant has been the minimal or absent language in Komen Foundation materials addressing possible environmental causes of breast cancer and the need for more research in this area. This recently has changed after much pressure from other breast cancer organizations, and that's a good thing. We hear plenty about the 5K race for the cure, but as a San Francisco activist who has had breast cancer and is now involved in the Think Before You Pink campaign, put it, you can race for the cure, but you can't run from the cause. Now a little bit about direct-to-consumer advertising of prescription drugs. Although recent press coverage has finally focused on some serious problems with the pharmaceutical industry, mainstream coverage of problems with so-called DTC, direct-to-consumer ads, has remained minimal. And yet these ads do influence all of us, even when we think that we are immune from them. Before 1997, prescription drugs generally were not advertised directly to consumer audiences, although it was legal to do so. Instead, such advertisements appeared only in journals published for doctors and other healthcare professionals. Since the August 1997 issuance of a special guidance from the Food and Drug Administration, pharmaceutical companies have been formally allowed to market these drugs directly to consumers. And this phenomenon of DTCA has burgeoned into a several billion dollar a year enterprise. Predictably, DTC ads have led to an increase of consumers and patients who request a wide range of prescription drugs from their doctors. In many cases, people are responding to advertising hype that well overstates a drug benefits, well, a drug's benefits, while downplaying its risks and problems. 
Most laypersons, and even many physicians, are unaware of the hundreds of letters that used to be sent out each year by the Food and Drug Administration requiring drug companies to retract their ads. In the past few years, this number has gone way down because the FDA has been far less vigilant with the monitoring of drug ads. In some cases, special warning letters required remedial ads at the same level of intensity as the original ad. Most letters were so-called untitled letters, which required withdrawal of the ad but no remedial measure. Since the FDA has a limited staff to cope with more than 33,000 pieces of ad material generated each year, it is not surprising that the review process has serious shortcomings. The case of tamoxifen, marketed by AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals under the brand name of Nolvidex, underscores some of the dilemmas confronting all of us who read these ads and who may be take, making decisions based upon misleading information. Although tamoxifen has a well-studied and often beneficial track record in the treatment of certain types of hormone-dependent breast cancer, it has been marketed widely for breast cancer risk reduction, incorrectly interpreted by many as meaning prevention. A closer look at AstraZeneca's advertising campaign for tamoxifen shows how drug company hype can seriously mislead us. First, a little history. The original data on tamoxifen for breast cancer risk reduction was released in April of 1998 with widespread publicity and glowing commentary. Here are just two examples of headlines that greeted readers on the day of the announcement. Tamoxifen lowers risk of breast cancer, Washington Post. Researchers find the first drug known to prevent breast cancer, New York Times. Dr. Alan Lickman, he was at, the, at that point the head of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, was quoted as saying, and I quote, people will look back at 1998 as the year that was the beginning of the end of breast cancer, end quote. With ongoing analysis of the data, a clearer picture emerged that reduced the number of women likely to benefit from taking tamoxifen for risk reduction of breast cancer. In 1999, the National Cancer Institute quietly published an article entitled, Weighing the Risks and Benefits for Tamoxifen Treatment for Preventing Breast Cancer. This article presented a far less positive picture than the one presented in 1998, but this newer information did not garner the media attention of the 1998 findings. Although thanks to the efforts of women's health activists, AstraZeneca was not permitted by the FDA to use the term prevention in its advertising, the company did run misleading ads in women's magazines. These ads, for example, compared relative benefits of the drug with absolute risk, pointing out, for example, a 46 percent reduction in breast cancer risk along with only a 1 to 2 percent risk of serious problems. The first is relative risk, the second is absolute. And the problems were things like endometrial cancer or blood clots. These ads did not mention that there was a 252% increased relative risk of endometrial cancer, along with this 46% risk reduction figure. That would be apples and apples. Nor the fact that a woman had only a 1.8% chance of benefiting from the drug at the same time that they had a, only a 1 to 2% risk of developing serious problems. Representing the data in a more complete and accurate manner would, of course, have painted a less rosy picture. After the National Women's Health Network sent the FDA a letter pointing out how these ads violated the DTCA regulations, the FDA did send AstraZeneca one of the few warning letters issued that year and required a retraction of the ad along with remedial advertising. Mind you, there are no financial penalties ever having to be paid here. Well, a group of us in the women's health movement, um, women's groups and one consumer group, responded to these problems with DTC advertising by forming a coalition called uh, the Prevention First Coalition. And we support the precautionary principle as the basis of regulatory and health policy and hope to challenge an emerging double standard in the cancer, cancer field where, for example, tamoxifen is often described as not perfect but a step on the way to the kind of pill we want. And everyone's dying for a pill for prevention at this moment. But, the, but at the same time, the imperfections and uncertainties inherent in environmental prevention become the basis for dismissing the environmental prevention approach altogether. 
And I will quote for you something we ascribe to, and that's called the precautionary principle of public health, or at least the um, opening statement to it, and it reads as follows. When an activity raises threats of harm to the environment or human health, Precautionary measures should be taken even if some cause and effect relationships are not fully established. Implementing the principle requires exploring alternatives to possibly harmful actions, placing the burden of proof on proponents of an activity rather than on victims or potential victims of the activity, and using democratic processes to carry out and enforce the principle. This is available at the Science and Environmental Health Network, SEHN.org, and in my slides you'll see a, um, a little more on that. Now I'm going to talk very briefly about a drug called Sarafam, which is basically Prozac repackaged in a serene pink and lavender capsule. This drug has been approved in the U.S. for treating something called premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD, a poorly defined disorder not recognized by the American Psychiatric Association and only listed in the appendix of the DSM-IV. That's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It also has been misleadingly promoted, for example, at an Eli Lilly website ad that suggested women who were irritable or who could not control their mood swings or couldn't zip up their jeans due to premenstrual bloating needed this drug. And of course, ads for Seraphim don't mention that exercise, less caffeine, calcium supplements, and more water are all safer approaches to premenstrual discomforts. They sometimes work, they sometimes don't. Interestingly, U.S. media largely ignored the news during the past year that Eli Lilly was forced to drop PMDD as one of the disorders it had previously listed for this drug in Europe. This followed a finding by the European Drug Regulatory Authority that the condition was not a well-established disease and thus marketing was inappropriate. It is probably worth mentioning that the media are now doing a much better job exposing many of the problems associated with all of the so-called SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. This is the newer class or one of the recent classes of antidepressant drugs. Um, there have been numerous lawsuits brought by parents against drug companies, particularly be because of problems with their adolescent children. And because of the process of discovery during these trials, um, clinical trial data that had been originally suppressed by the manufacturers and not available even to the adver advisory panel at the FDA um, came available, and you probably read some of the articles in the newspapers where panel members were told, had I seen that clinical trial data, I would not have recommended approval. And now there's a black box warning, and um, in the UK, for example, all physicians some years ago were sent a letter not to prescribe um, several of the antidepressants in this class to any adolescents unless we're truly extenuating circumstances. For those of you who might be interested, by the way, The Truth About the Drug Companies, a book by Dr. Marsha Angel, a former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, is an ex excellent expose of what is happening now with the drug industry, not just about advertising and promotion, but about how research priorities are determined, how research is conducted, and how prices are inflated far beyond what is necessary for reaping a reasonable profit. Now a bit about tobacco. Tobacco is worth mentioning, particularly as we see more and more examples of smoking in television and movies today. Promotion of tobacco may be a little more subtle than before, but it is alive and well. Data from the National Health Interview Survey of more than 102,600 women showed an abrupt increase in smoking initiation in girls under 18 around 1967, when tobacco advertising introduced specific brands of cigarettes for women. There have been recent activist responses to the promotion of tobacco use in women. For example, the We've Found Our Voice Without Tobacco campaign, which has prepared a short, short PowerPoint presentation critiquing, critiquing tobacco advertising. I'll show you a little of it later. The Legacy Foundation survey, um, which was conducted in July, uh, well, actually it was released in July of 2003, included some very interesting statistics, again, the media did not well report on. 25% of young women aged 16 to 24 smoked in 2002. Some communities it's less, some communities it's more. 65% of young women who smoke said they were thinking of quitting within six months. 
It's not a habit people like after a while. 83% of young women believe they would be able to quit if they wanted to. 60% of young women smokers aged 16 to 24 tried to quit during the previous year. Among young women who tried to quit in the previous year, only 3% succeeded in quitting for at least a year. Girls ages 12 to 19 are more likely than boys to attempt to quit smoking, 31% versus 24%. I don't know many young women who are aware of these statistics, and there is ongoing research that is trying to explore why women have a harder time quitting than men do. Probably some hormonal connection here, but it is being studied. It's an important question, and it's all the more reason we have to look to prevention when it comes to adopting the tobacco habit, because women do have a tougher time quitting. Now a moment to reflect upon Viagra. Uh, last year, Mika Lowy's book, The Rise of Viagra, How the Little Blue Pill Changed Sex in America, argues that Pfizer has capitalized on male sexual insecurity by promoting the concept of erectile dysfunction, a new category of problem in need of a pricey treatment. She says that widespread use of the drug since 1998 by around 16 million men, young and old, is altering ideas of masculinity to the point where male self-worth is increasingly measured by supercharged sexual performance. I'm going to show you an ad for Viagra in a minute, which demonstrates that it isn't really a drug, and other drugs like Cialis and Levitra, they're not drugs primarily or only for men with erectile dysfunction resulting from um, a problem or a condition. They're really for all men. They're being marketed to young men, to older men, any men. Much current media misleadingly notes that 30 to 50 percent of U.S. men and women have organic sexual dysfunction. This hype has paved the way for a newly perceived need for these drugs among women. A group of activists, the working group on a new view of women's sexual problems, has begun a campaign to counter this PR-driven misinformation, beginning with a working paper entitled A New View of Women's Sexual Problems. It's posted at our website and also at the New View website. I'm going to make, say a few things about um, embryo stem cell research, um, just very few things if you're interested in talking about it more afterwards, I'd, I'd like to get into it. Um, I want you all to know that our organization strongly supports embryo stem cell research, although we have severe um, qualms and concerns about one small subset of research called somatic cell nuclear transfer, sometimes called embryo cloning research cloning, therapeutic cloning, which is a misnomer because if there are going to be therapies, there are quite a bit in the distance. And our major concern surrounds the fact that multiple egg extraction, which is already ongoing in IVF clinics in the infertility context, that multiple egg extraction does pose significant known and unknown risks for the many young women who will be asked to donate eggs for this research enterprise. And we think, particularly in the given the the uh, status of this research at this moment and the clear benefits that we have at this moment versus the uh, hypothetical benefits that until we have better data so that we can get true informed consent, we should not be pursuing multiple egg extraction for somatic cell nuclear transfer. There are other ways to get a few eggs, and we can talk about that during the discussion period if you are interested in um, I think now is the moment to turn to the slides. I'd like to go through them and leave some time for discussion. Next. Um, I just want to tell you that if any of you are interested, this PowerPoint presentation, I'm happy to email to anyone with these websites on there. Um, there are some very good sources of information, particularly for breast implants from these two sites. One of them, breastimplantinfo.org, has very nice PDF files you can simply download, print, and make copies of, um, just so you know that. Next, now I'm going to show you some pictures. This is what you see at the um, implant manufacturer or the plastic surgeon website. You'll see before and after. Next, you will not see um, pictures such as this. This is an example of capsular contracture. Next. Uh, this is an example of um, what, what happens after implants are removed because of problems. There's more disfigurement. Next, this is necrosis um, that, that happens in a small percentage of the cases, somewhere around 3 to 6 percent, depending on where you are. Next. 
And this is what happens when silicone implants are um, leaking, then removed, um, a woman can be severely deformed. Next. All right, I want to just next say a few things about this issue, which I've mentioned already. I want to summarize that the benefits are overstated, um, risks understated, uh, that we don't get corrective ads enough, and that we don't basically see remedial action. Next. Um, this is a truism that the reason we're seeing all these ads is because advertising works, especially for the blockbuster drugs. Um, and the promotional campaigns do send us all to doctors' offices. Doctors are beleaguered with these um, pleas for particular drugs. Next. This data, um, these data are old, um, from 2002. Lipitor, which is the top-selling drug in the world, is now an over $7 billion a year product. And I, I'm, I'm bringing this in here just to show you um, that annual sales figures are quite phenomenal, and we have probably around 20 what we call blockbuster drugs that sell over a billion dollars a year. There are a few of the SSRIs on this list. Um, some of them are uh, familiar to you, um, anti-acid drugs. Uh, the, the question about statin drugs, the cholesterol-lowering drugs, and the benefits to women is one that's been reopened recently. And I encourage um, any of you want to explore this, particularly if you're women, um, there's information we can send to you. We'll be posting it at, at our website soon. Um, there was an assumption that the benefits would accrue for women just as they had for men, but there are some differences. And there's actually some evidence that there's, in many cases, more harm than good done. So you have to be careful when you um, start using statin drugs that you're an appropriate candidate. Next. Um, this is a very, very funny story. I love this story. This shows you what happens when you have the kind of advertising where all the risks and benefits can't be described. So we have this kind of people running through the field and, you know, call your doctor and you'll be happy too. Uh, so there's this story where two boys walk into a pharmacy, pick out a box of Tampax and proceed to the checkout counter and the man says to the older, how old are you? Next. Eight, the boy replied. The man continues, do you know how these are used? The boy replied, not exactly, but they aren't for me. They're for him. He's my brother. He's four. We saw on TV that if you use these, you'd be able to swim and ride a bike, and he can't do either one. <laughs> it's just, um, there are many stories like this. This is one of the funnier ones where people have no idea what's even being advertised. Um, this is the group. Next, I just want to give you an example of who we are. Next. Um, Breast Cancer Action in San Francisco, which has one of the best websites um, uh, containing all kinds of wonderful information about breast cancer. Center for Medical Consumers in New York and these other groups listed here. Several of us are in Massachusetts. And Women in Health Protection in Canada, which is a marvelous organization. Next. Um, these are our goals. Um, that's okay. Um, this is the campaign I mentioned earlier. It was started by Breast Cancer Action, and they have a good deal of, uh, I think, compelling evidence for why many of these um, pink campaigns don't actually do as much good as we think. They're cause-related marketing campaigns that often benefit a company's image, but don't always get the money where you think it's going to. Next. Okay, a little bit about unpaid advertising next, and I, this is one of my favorite examples. This is um, when Parade Magazine put model Lauren Hutton on its cover for a piece about beauty tips, and they quoted her saying, her number one secret is estrogen. It's good for your moods. It's good for your skin. If I had to choose between all my creams and makeup for feeling and looking good, I'd take the estrogen. Next. The article didn't mention that Hutton was a paid spokesperson for Wyeth Ayrst and that she also appeared in their ads. Furthermore, there was no mention that Hutton's claims for estrogen's benefits were not backed up by val valid scientific evidence. Now, since then, we have the famous Women's Health Initiative. We know that there are serious drawbacks to routine use of estrogens. We know that um, the particular drug that was studied the most, Prempro, which is a combination of estrogen and progestin, not only does not improve heart health, it potentially hurts heart health. All of this has been well publicized. But it's interesting that in, in Parade Magazine, viewed by millions of people, none of this was disclosed. Next. Okay, this is a little bit of the 
These are the statistics I just read to you. If any of you want this PowerPoint presentation, you'll get them. Next. Next, we've already talked about these. Um, and next. Now, smoking is still glamorized on the big screen. Um, the PG-13 Sony Pictures film, Mona Lisa Smiles, shows a young woman smoking, talking about smoking, or displaying a pack of camels or Winstons about every four minutes. There are sociologists who's having, who actually have sat with television programs and movies with their stopwatches to just chronicle just how much tobacco use is in, um, uh, in the movies and on television. And when I um, used to listen to my husband when he'd read these movie magazines at night, every now and then he'd toss one over to me and say, there's another example where um, Philip Morris gave $500,000 to a director to script in smoking when the original screenplay had nobody smoking. And the director walked off with $500,000 to paid for a whole set, uh, didn't even have to use the brand name because the company had market share, just had to have someone smoking. That's how sometimes you get product placement through somebody offering this kind of wonderful uh, financial uh, incentive. Next. This is what happens, oh, see, this is the part of it that's a problem. Uh, a group of young women um, got together with a group of women physicians to produce their own slideshow to counter the advertising and promotion of tobacco. Next, they decided to find their own voice without tobacco. That, whoops, back. That, um, Philip Morris had a big campaign where they, it was called Find Your Own Voice, and they featured African-American women and Latinas and Asian-American women. And they had a beautiful picture, in this case, of a white woman, and it said, look temptation right in the eye, and then make your own decision. Then you have this little warning there. Next. And the girls said, we say smoking is not just, whoops, <laughs> not just a temptation, it's an addiction. Next. Philip Morris says, never let the goody two-shoes get you down, back. And it's a very attractive African-American woman, beautifully made up. Um, and then the young women next got a picture of their own, an, also an attractive young woman. Um, and can you go back? Well, basically, they say, don't let anyone get you down. You've got two good shoes of your own. Next. This is an interesting one where they, back, they featured... Um, a Latina with, you know, a yellow rose in her mouth, you know, and to dance around naked with a rose between your teeth if you want. Uh, but do it like you mean it. And then next, the young woman said, dancing naked with a rose is fine, but not when you're gasping for breath. And then they have their own version of an attractive Latina. Next. Um, then there was this very stereotypical representation of an Asian woman um, in garb with a fan looking very demure and subservient. In silence I see, with wisdom I speak. Next. And the young woman said, with wisdom we see right through tobacco companies. Next. Um, have we really come a long way? The tobacco industry has twisted themes of women's independence to sell the ultimate dependence, addiction, and then, well, more than 23 million women smoke every day. Lung cancer is now the leading cause of cancer deaths among women. And in, and in Las Vegas and Nevada, that happened in the 1970s. Lung cancer surpassed breast cancer as the leading cause of death in the late 70s. Next. This is the book I mentioned. Next. Um, and I, next. This is the ad. Um, and this is typical. Viagra, it works for older guys, younger guys, even skeptical guys. And some of the ads have men much younger than this man. And the idea is that um, you, would, you would benefit in it. You don't have to have a particular medical problem. I've been on a number of college campuses recently, and at least four or five young men have come up to me and said, well, you know, our recreational drug of choice now is Viagra and they're using it on weekends, and the idea is this supercharged sexual performance. And I worry with, you know, long-term use, consistent use, even young healthy men may develop problems they otherwise wouldn't have. Now, we all know the stories about men who shouldn't have taken Viagra, who knew they shouldn't have, who had contraindications that are written in ads like this, took it anyway and developed serious problems, and a number of them have died. The FDA has collected um, uh, uh, more um, cases of deaths than we would like to 
believe is possible, but in most cases, these were um, instances where the drug should never have been used. Next. This is the um, uh, website for the Campaign for a New w View of Women's Sexual Problems. Next. <laughs> and um, I do want to mention this because most of us use cosmetics. And most of us don't think much about the fact that the skin is an organ and it absorbs all manner of things. There is a wonderful campaign that's involving many young people now called the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics. It includes many groups, labor groups, women's groups, educational groups, health groups. Uh, and there is a website, safecosmetics.org, that leads you to another wonderful website, and that is the website of the Environmental Working Group, which has issued a report called Skin Deep. And it enables you to uh, put in their search engine all of the products, the personal care products you use, and it will tell you exactly what's in it and any studies that show problems or human health um, effects from those products, um, the chemicals and substances that are in those personal care products. And obviously the goal is to protect the health of consumers and workers by requiring health and beauty industry to phase out the use of chemicals that are known or suspected carcinogens, mutagens, or reproductive toxins. Um, phthalates, for example, they've come out of all the European cosmetics and now they're finally coming out of some of the cosmetics in this country. Parabens is a substance that's ubiquitous. It's in practically any um, product you'll buy and there are very serious questions about the negative health effects of parabens products. Next. Um, I, I just want to say that this is um, for me, a good summary of some of the ways in which the media have contributed to problems. I would say that the, this obsession with thinness and the hourglass figure uh, has led to disordered eating and eating disorders. You know, it starts out innocently. It's not a pathology. Uh, young girls trying to diet, often on severe weight loss diets that are not good for them, then ending up with severe eating disorders that then require medical solutions. Um, ex and the media are replete with examples of, of encouraging women to engage in dieting and cosmetic surgery um, of all manner. Um, if you see things like, what is it, the makeover, extreme makeover, the swan, there's about four or five of these programs out there that very cavalierly show you before and after and you often don't get a good sense of um, the terrible things that can happen. The misuse of prescription drugs, a premature faith in genetic fixes. I think the media are responsible for much of the hype there. And the rising rates of tobacco use in young women and the rising rates of risky cosmetic surgery procedures. I might add to this in my own assessment that we've had, um, just do the next one. I'm going to um, leave it there for a minute. Um, my own concern about the medicalization of childbirth and the absence of evidence-based practice in much of obstetrics and the absence of choices for women who might like to use midwives, have a birth in a birth center, or even at home. We have good studies that show these choices are safe choices, but they're not available to many women because of either the insurance industry or medical opposition. And what's happened as a result of the kind of media representation of birth as this scary, awful, painful thing, women are choosing elective cesareans. This is a surgical delivery. Um, because they are more afraid of birth than they are of a surgical procedure. And if you look at what we know, that doesn't make sense rationally, but that is what comes of this kind of impression that you get. Now I'm going to close with some wonderful slides of pictures of the foreign language adaptations of our bodies ourselves. This is the French African edition produced a year and a half ago by a group of women in Senegal and we're currently try to, trying to help them raise money. They've given out their thousand copies to the NGOs, the non-governmental organizations and to uh, clinics and women's organizations and we're hoping to get um, the book reprinted actually in the United States this time and then shipped back to West uh, Africa. Next, this is the Chinese edition which hopefully will be adapted. This is more of a direct translation. They did have problems with the Chinese censors but they managed cleverly to get some of the material into the book anyway. Next. This is the Serbian edition, and that picture is taken from their first ever Take Back the Night March that was held in Belgrade. Next. 
This is the old Arabic um, inspired version of the book and I'm happy to report that we are in the, at the moment supporting a group of women in Lebanon, in Jordan, a Moroccan women and possibly women from Egypt, all coordinated by a group of Palestinian women in East Jerusalem who will produce a real adaptation of this new Our Bodies Ourselves that just came out a month ago or a few weeks ago. Um, and they are very excited about this project and we are now um, seeking funding for them in the United States. There's a possibility they'll get support from the Hariri Foundation. Uh, I do hope this project um, gets off the ground. The women involved are extremely excited and they're extremely talented and they come from both the social and the physical and biological sciences. Next. This is the Armenian edition, which hopefully will go into a new printing and an updated, in an updated version next year. And because I'm Armenian, I was able to raise funds from some Armenian individuals in the United States, and it's um, been very well received in that country. Next. This is the Bulgarian edition. Next. This is the old Russian edition, out of print, and we have made contact with a wonderful group, an interdisciplinary group in St. Petersburg, Russia, that has asked us to help them with fundraising so they can produce a new Russian edition based on our new English edition. Next. This is a the Romanian edition. Um, next. The Polish edition is the most recent release, just about a month and a half ago. And they also have a whole radio program that goes with the book. And they have rock stars and prominent, um, um, you know, singers who've been doing sound spots and, you know, public service announcements to promote the messages that are in the book, things like safer sex practices. Next. This is the old Hebrew edition. And again, there's a group of women in Israel right now who are trying to get a new edition off the ground. Next. This is the Thai edition, next. This is from India, Telugu, next. This is the old Greek edition, and it's another um, language that we hope will be updated. Um, this is quite old. It's from the 70s, in fact. Next. This is the Japanese edition, next. And this is the Spanish cultural adaptation, uh, Nuestros Cuerpos Nuestras Vidas, which I happen to have with me here. If any of you are working in a Latino community, would like to take it with you. And we're hoping that in the next year or two, we'll create a collaboration with one of the Centers for Excellence in Hispanic Health, possibly Albert Einstein in Montefiore in the Bronx, possibly other institutions, so that this can be updated and reissued um, by the year 2006 or seven. Next, this is the cover of the new book. And we have been uh, very excited to see how, respo how response has been so positive up to now. We've been getting many calls, lots of radio interest, and a couple of tours, and the big one coming up next week. Uh, we're the, the um, segment that was done for the early show on April 28th is available as a video stream at the CBS News website if you want to go see it. And there are uh, also many other interviews and uh, articles about the book that have come out in places like the Star-Ledger, the Seattle Post-Intelligencer, the Seattle Times, coming out in other major newspapers as we are planning events in the next few weeks. So now it's your turn, but just remember you have to wait for the microphone before you say anything. So raise your hand and Monica will find you. And maybe we can get some light in here so she can even see. Great. Well, a little bit better. Right. Anyone have a comment or a question? And I'm really sorry that I spoke so fast. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was very happy you brought up the comments about um, birthing in America. And I think it's one of the biggest problems we have is the way... Um, the way we think about it and the way it's handled. Every single night, practically, there's another article on the news on TV about, oh, this person had an accidental birth in their home or in their car, and it's like this great big deal that they have to cover when it's like if it's that easy, you know? I mean, what can we do about it? How can we change? 
Well, that's one of the things we're working on right now. We, we, in collaboration with some other groups whose sole focus is childbirth, pregnancy. Um, Maternity Center Association in New York City has begun a very important initiative to try to make maternity care more evidence-based than it is right now. They also have a great booklet called Journey to Parenthood, which is um, available from them. We are making a Spanish language cultural adaptation of it right now. And one of the things that they and we do is promote the midwifery model of care. And we talk a lot about that in the book. There, it's one thing to have an unplanned home birth or, you know, where sometimes things do go wrong. There's no sense of uh, uh, watching for problems. If you have a midwife and you're monitoring carefully, there are very few true three, four, five minutes takes place most of the time. Um, I know that sometimes things don't go well. Sometimes the pain does get beyond the point that someone can stand. Midwives can help with an epidural then if that's what you want and need. But very often, Midwives help you get past those tough moments. Um, sometimes you can just get into a tub of water, or if you're lucky to have a jacuzzi, you know, you put the jets on your back for back labor, and the pain goes away. We've seen it over and over again. And I think that people don't understand that there, there can be a, a healthy, safe, more low-tech approach to birth, birth that also is accompanied by enormous satisfaction. MCA did a fabulous survey called Listening to Mothers. It's posted at their website. And the outcome from women making all the choices that they have been is not that women are happier or more satisfied. That's the sad part. Um, women are not happier or more satisfied having made the choices that they did at times. And, and in many cases, they were unnecessary medical interventions because of initial decisions. One of the things we, I've always said is that, you know, if you really would like to keep medical interventions um, to a minimum, sometimes they're absolutely needed, uh, starting out with a midwife might be your best guarantee for that. I had a midwife. In fact, I even had a home birth, and it allowed me to control the environment better. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The medical industry is so powerful, and... Um, there is such, um, the, like, they just, there's no support and they'll attack you basically if you don't have enough strength it's, to stand up for those choices. I mean, what? like, the, they roll their eyes in their head about the idea of having twins at home, but people do it. You just have more midwives present, you know, and, and you make sure it's safe, that the conditions are right for doing it. But the medical industry thinks the midwives are crazy for doing that kind of thing. They think home birth is not safe. And, they'll, and even right. midwives, nurse midwives that work at hospitals have this right. attitude. Well, having twins at home is more risky. And, and women who've thought about it, some have decided to go ahead, many have decided not. Um, there are circumstances that make a home birth more risky than if you started in the hospital. But one of the things you have to understand is that there's, there's going to be no magic solution here. And yes, all of the forces are out there. Even within medicine, there have been some very good studies showing that routine episiotomies make no sense. They not only don't do good, they can do harm. We just had another study come out last week about this, but the practice continues. It's still at 30-something percent nationally, and it's up to 70 percent in some settings, and that shouldn't be the case. And when Dr. Michael Klein went around this country doing grand rounds, presenting the results of his very well-designed trial and study, he found enormous resistance among his colleagues. So change comes slowly. But there are people in the field trying to get us moving more in an evidence-based direction. So we just got to keep working at it. Yes. Hi. Um, I would like to ask you to reiterate your entire set of points about um, possibly suspect so-called grassroots organizations, what you said they were doing, and so forth. Um, uh, there are many groups, and I can't think of their names in my head. There's one that's... Um, that was formed by the petrochemical industry to debunk the idea that global warming is a problem. And they got scientists who were paid by the petrochemical industry to come forward and say uh, global warming is all a scare tactic. There's no such thing. And, but the name of the organization, you know, I forget what it is, the Citizens Group for something or other. It, it sounded like it was a grassroots organization like the National Women's Health Network. But it really wasn't. It was really an entity created by the industry 
with a specific agenda to make people think global warming is not a problem. Um, there are some groups that have received a lot of money from the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I can give you an example, actually. The National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, I'm sure they do a lot of wonderful work. But they also distort at times. Um, how many of you saw A Beautiful Mind about John, no, John Nash, right? Well, funny reason, his first name sounded wrong to me. Um, at the end of that film, did you notice that he says something like, I still take my, I, I still see these images, but I take my drugs? Remember that? That's actually not true. And the person who wrote the book was quite upset about it because he and his wife felt that it was her ability to help him wean himself from drugs that were actually causing much of his problem. Uh, and he did have problems even without um, taking drugs, but he actually managed to live his life towards the end much more productively with actually fewer hallucinations and problems because he had weaned himself of the drugs. And the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill convinced the director that if you let the public see that people can wean themselves, um, although it has to be done slowly, you never go off mood-altering drugs quickly, um, they, people would not take their drugs the way they should. So they convinced him to script it in. And this actually flies in the face of good evidence. Uh, we have Dr. Joe Glenn Mullen, who's a Harvard psych psychiatrist writing books, trying to help parents who want to wean their children off of some of these mood-altering drugs that are now starting to cause problems. They help for a while, but many of the drugs, after a while, start to cause a set of problems. Sometimes the problems are similar to the initial problems for which the drugs were prescribed. This is a complicated area. But it's important that we try to recognize that we don't have a lot of answers in and that when we start using drugs over the long period, certain things might happen. Long-term use of drugs might well be associated with another set of problems we didn't anticipate. Um, so NAMI had an influence on a film that then misled people into thinking that, of course, the only way John Nash managed towards the end of his life was by taking these drugs up to the end. And his, his version and his wife's version was that it was because he weaned themselves that he managed as well as he did. Hi. Wait a second. Oh. I'm so sorry, I'm forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> I find going to the doctor for some uh, medical situations and illnesses similar to going to the auto mechanic. Uh, I don't know anything about cars either. And I, I regard myself as a smart, well-informed, I do research on the web sort of individual. But I've noticed as my mom has gotten into her 50s, uh, you know, we've been trying to work through menopause together. I have more questions than answers. You know, Premarin or not Premarin, and I know you briefly touched on estrogen earlier, black cohosh, all of these different things. I don't even know if I'm saying that right. Um, you know, homeo I bring up the idea of homeopathic remedies and people, medical doctors seem to glaze over. Even my own primary care physician, who I now have my mother going to, um, you know, kind of like push that aside. And I, I don't know where to find fact from fiction in this kind of journey through menopause. And I, I just don't even know how to be helpful or active for her. It's really frustrating. So I wondered if you could speak to that at all and maybe point us in some directions of places that we could really trust mm -hmm. to get answers and information. And I, related to that, I also wonder how much, and you're going to kill me saying this, but how much of menopause, I mean, menopause is a natural thing that women go through. I know it's hell, well, I don't know it's hell like some women here know that it's hell, but how much of it are we masking that we need to go through and are there things that we're medicating that are going to end up hurting her? I'll leave it at that. Well, you've asked a lot <laughs> and I'll try to be slower. Um, first of all, it is a good idea to try to inform yourself about a problem or an issue before you go to your practitioner if only because under managed care systems, 
our doctors, our nurses, our nurse practitioners, our midwives, they're all under time constraints, and they can't spend that much time with us. So when you come in a little bit better informed, the meeting, the exchange, the 15, 20 minutes you sometimes get is more productive. Now, how to tell if the information is good or not, as I said earlier, sometimes knowing the source, we actually have a guide at our website and in our book about using the Internet to get good health information. There are some very good websites in the midst of all the junk, and so you can find that out. Government has some excellent websites, and they make information available in lay language, consumer-friendly. That's what we've tried to do with our website and with our book, and it's something we've done for decades, and we've gotten pretty good at it to make things clear. Sometimes there isn't a clear answer. Very often when it comes to taking hormones, uh, it isn't so crystal clear what you should do. Now, most women go through menopause without significant problems, but there's a good percentage, and maybe it's 20, 30 percent, that have severe side effects and problems. Things like sweats and hot flashes that are so intense and they come 20 times a day. And even if you wear layered clothing and bring along your fan, it just doesn't cut it. And so for women who are having really extreme reactions, taking estrogen might make very good sense. And even though we have this data that really tell us don't use it for heart health benefits, uh, the, 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 the risks are not so enormous that one should live in misery if nothing else works. Now, sometimes other things work. And you can see in our website and in, ver in various websites um, a, a number of products that are estrogen-like herbs, for example, in their effect on the body, and they seem to work. That doesn't mean that they're um, a whole lot safer. We have not studied them for safety. Um, they might in the long run have some of the same side effects and problems. But the point is, if you're miserable having hot flashes, you ought to do something about it, um, you know. And if you're not, there's no need necessarily to pursue taking hormones. Now, the other reason women get prescribed estrogen uh, is off, uh, has to do with osteoporosis and the loss of bone density. And there are some women who will rapidly lose bone density at the time of menopause. It's something worth watching. However, the... Um, Promotion of drugs like Fosamax, for example, um, has now been accompanied by a growing body of evidence that suggests, yes, there will be, bone will be rebuilt, but it might be bone that is more brittle and more likely to fracture. So just because you have more bone density doesn't mean it's stronger bone that you've produced. These are questions being looked at now. And there are side effects and problems. So uh, whether it's estrogen, whether and if you're taking estrogen for bone density, you can't ever stop. So then you have to weigh the increased risk of breast cancer, um, the increased, small increased risk of some heart problems. It's, it's, it's got to be an individual decision. This is not an easy thing where one shoe, one size fits all. Uh, there, I think, are some things that, women can do that make a difference that don't cost anything. One of them is to make sure you're drinking enough water, getting enough exercise, eating well. I've heard more than a few women come up to me and say, I started to have sweet potatoes three times a week, and they have progestin-like substances in them, particularly, you know, certain kind of yams. And within a few weeks, my hot flashes subsided. They weren't so bad. So, you know, they got that from someone. I had hot flashes for a while. They weren't intense, but I said, oh, let me try it out. You know, I'm always interested in experimenting. And I had that experience, too. Not that they were so terrible, but they practically went away. So what is it, you know, about eating, you know, you know sweet potatoes three times a week? Um, and, oh, there's some literature on this, but it doesn't work for everyone. It only works for some people. So there are many things like this on the Internet. They're worth trying. You know, psoriasis plagues many people. I discovered from an audience once that someone had taken omega-3 fats, flaxseed oil, um, and had really supplemented the diet substantially. And her psoriasis went away after 30 years of using tar-like substances and drugs. And lo and behold, a friend of mine tried it, disappeared. Taking flaxseed oil in the morning and night, I don't know, a tablespoon, within a few weeks, psoriasis went away. And then I kept asking people, sure enough, it was in the sort of lore. People knew it, and then I went to the Internet, and I found it there. 
It's on the Internet, but I would never have found out about it, nor would the people who'd gone to dermatologists who prescribed conventional remedies known about it. And flaxseed oil is something we know that won't likely be harmful. I mean, it's a substance found in products um, that we eat naturally. So that's the, an example of the kind of thing where you can find out something that would benefit um, possibly benefit you, probably won't harm you. I would say if you look at the prevailing diet of young women right now, many young women don't get enough omega-3 fats in their diet. These substances are essential for prostaglandin production, for reproductive health functioning. And I think it really is important if there are young women in our lives that we look, we have them look at their diets to make sure they are getting omega-3 fats. There's this obsession with fat right now so that young women, if they're not really thinking about diet and food in a really thoughtful, careful way, are trying to eliminate all fat from their diet. Good fats and bad fats, all fats. And you need fats. So we've got a kind of disconnect here uh, in our culture. We've got to really change that. Yes. I, um, I wonder, often the pharmaceutical companies will tell you that the reason why the prices have gone up is because of the need for funds for research, and yet the U.S. government provides so much of the funds for the research. And um, I was wondering if you've done any studies on correlation between the price of pharmaceuticals since the uh, ban on advertising was lifted. Well, I can tell you right now that um, the percent of the budget going into R&D is going down. The percent going into promotion is going up. You are right that the government does fund a lot of research. Private industry does as well. Um, one of the problems is that many of them are Me Too drugs. They're not really innovative drugs. It's really hard to find and create and develop a truly innovative drug. Um, one of the problems we've seen recently with the rush to engage in um, stem cell therapies is that state governments, California is a very good example, have not paid close enough attention to the question of what happens when and if therapies are produced. What about intellectual property rights? What about licensing agreements? What about limits on what we're going to charge? Are we going to get expensive therapies that will be accessible only to the wealthy? Prop 71, the famous Prop 71 in California, the $3 billion initiative, which if you add in the interest is a $6 billion initiative, was riddled with this kind of problem. And after the fact, members of the California legislature are trying to introduce new bills that will correct some egregious shortcomings. Right now, the state of Washington is trying to um, deal with a $350 million bill. And I have with me um, a guest columnist, um, Sean O'Connor, who teaches at the University of Washington. It was published last month. Um, and, a, and an article titled Ownership Battles and Science Funding. And I, I'm happy to share it with you if you want to come up and get it. This is an example of what's happening in state after state. Nobody is writing into the legislation a guarantee that the state will definitely see a return on its investment. And that is a crime, I think. Okay, we have two more. One here and one up back. Uh, I wondered what you had to say in your book on women and AIDS. Young women and AIDS. Well, there's that's a whole chapter, so I can't really summarize it. We we talk a lot about prevention, about the fact that mostly women of color um, are have the highest rates of HIV/AIDS. Uh, access to the antiretroviral viral drugs are um, is limited in many communities, less so here, but more so in other countries. We try to take a somewhat global view of, of issues such as HIV AIDS, which is devastating many parts of Africa, even Asia. Um, and in some countries, it's still denied as a problem. Uh, obviously, prevention would be the best thing. With the abstinence-only curriculum that has been introduced into this country by our illustrious federal government, and now we've had a chance to study the impact of abstinence-only education. What we're seeing is that the rates of STIs are rising because young people think that condoms are of absolutely no use, and in fact, they might increase your risk of developing HIV-AIDS. There's a lot of poorly 
de created poorly defined material, misinformation that comes through these programs, and, and individuals that try to present an alternative. For example, CECAS, the Sex Information and Education Council of the U.S., has wonderful curricula and wonderful materials based on, um, on their website, they have resource people, and if teachers and if school systems engage in providing more balanced information, they risk losing their federal funding. So we have, I think that that is actually a more serious threat to STI, sexually transmissible infections, HIV AIDS, um, than anything else right now, that we're, we're producing a generation of young people who are so misinformed. I was at two medical schools recently where the faculty are telling me they are having to re-educate incoming medical students about HIV AIDS and prevention, the role of barrier methods, because the students have been through this kind of abstinence-only education or miseducation, if, to, to kind of define it more accurately. Okay, we'll take one more. Hi, I wondered if you had any comments on um, nursing issues, breastfeeding, and how, the role of the media and the formula lobby, um, if your organization follows any sort of legislation at the national level or local level uh, that supports nursing moms. Uh, yes. <clears throat> we are quite committed to promoting breastfeeding and to giving women accurate information. As you might know, the World Health Organization has instituted a baby-friendly hospital um, approach and only a few dozen hospitals in this whole country qualify as baby friendly. One of them is here. It's the Boston Medical Center. And the reason the breastfeeding rates are so high at the Boston Medical Center is because a pediatrician who came into the hospital and saw abysmally low breastfeeding rates and was told our women aren't interested in breastfeeding responded with, well, has anyone really shared with women the benefits of breastfeeding? Have have women really been well informed here? So she embarked upon a campaign, educated the CEO, um, practitioners, people who cleaned the floors, who did the laundry, who brought the food into rooms, um, anybody who set foot in that hospital uh, was educated. And it wasn't long before everybody became a convert. And now they're seeing lower rates of um, infection among the infants, re uh, respiratory distress. They're seeing babies, fewer babies in the neonatal intensive care unit. They're seeing babies that are healthier. And mothers are proud of their ability to feed their babies. Now, Boston Medical Center serves mostly low-income women, Latinas, African-American women. Um, they've done a wonderful film about what they've accomplished. Of course, they had to stop giving out free formula samples because that's an inappropriate mis mixed message. So whatever thousands of dollars a year they were getting from the industry, they gave that up. But they're benefiting because of healthier babies and healthier families. Now, you all know there is a national breastfeeding campaign. It has really catchy ads. Some of the ads that were created by the Ad Council of America didn't get to, to be aired because of opposition from the uh, formula industry. They even went so far as to approach the president and the executive director of the American Academy of Pediatrics to get a letter sent to the then Secretary of Health and Human Health, Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson, asking him to slow down the process of instituting this breastfeeding campaign. Um, because the Ad Council had figured out through all of their focus groups that the effective way to do this is not just to say breastfeeding is nice, it's good for you, it's good for your baby, but to tell women some of the bad things that happen when you don't breastfeed. They said the only way to motivate breastfeeding effectively is to use a somewhat negative campaign. Now we've done that with other things. We have other campaigns where we've promoted the idea of if you don't do this, something bad will happen. Uh, your babies are more likely to have this problem or that problem. So the interesting thing with this effort is that after this letter was written, the two co-chairs of the Breastfeeding Practice Committee of the American Academy of Pediatrics were not very happy because they had been working with the National Breastfeeding Campaign and they liked the spots. They liked all of these um, short 30 and 60 second, second promotional pieces. And so they wrote their own letter to Tommy Thompson and said, we don't agree with what you just heard from our 
our illustrious president and executive director, and we're the real public policy setting. I, I know some of you are aware that breastfeeding rates were on the rise and then they started to dip again. They dipped last year. That is absolutely absurd. If anything, we should be promoting breastfeeding. And if you live in an area where anybody ever gets chastised for breastfeeding in public or a woman is asked to leave a place, um, you, should, you should speak up on behalf of that woman. In Europe, nothing like this would ever happen. Breastfeeding is commonplace. It's supported. But we still have a ways to go in the United States. There are still examples of women getting arrested for breastfeeding in this country. I guess that's okay. the last one. If you want to get a book, we've got books here, and I'm happy to inscribe them as a Mother's Day gift mm -hmm. or a graduation present. It is a, a mother load of information, and we hope that you use it well. And come to our website, Companion. It, it amplifies what's in the book. We have lots of good material there, and use it frequently. I think you'll find it helpful. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming.